Good morning. My name is Sarah Paradis, and this is the Boise State Trombone Choir. We are delighted to perform two selections for you this morning. The first is an arrangement of Earth Song by Frank Tekeli. Tekeli first wrote this piece for voices, and he set it to original poetry. I would like to read this poem for you today. Sing, be, live, see. This dark, stormy hour, the wind it stirs, the scorched earth cries out in vain. O oh, war and power, you blind and blur, the torn heart cries out in pain. But music and singing have been my refuge, and music and singing shall be my light, a light of song, shining strong, hallelujah. Through darkness, pain, and strife, I'll sing, be, live, see. Thank you. This last and final piece we will play 
is called Fantasy and Double Fugue by Eric Ewazen. We would like to extend our thanks to the president for inviting us to perform this morning. It truly is an honor. Good morning. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you and to introduce our president, Dr. Marlene Trump. You can applaud now. <laughs> Before joining Boise State on July 1st of this year, Dr. Trump was the campus provost and executive vice, vice chancellor 
at the University of California, Santa Cruz, ranked by US News and World Report as the 26th best public university in the country. Before joining the UC system, uh, broadly recognized as the premier public university in the world, Dr. Trump was the Dean of Arizona State University's new Interdisciplinary College of Arts and Sciences and the Vice Provost for the university's West Campus. Trump was praised at Arizona State for overseeing new academic programs, including a new interdisciplinary forensics major and a cybersecurity initiative, and for creating mentoring programs for first-generation students. She also co-chaired a university-wide task force aimed at combating sexual assault. At the UC Santa Cruz, she launched faculty development initiatives, new support programs for staff, and led the community in the creation of a new academic strategic plan. She grew up in Green River, Wyoming, a Trona mining town on Interstate 80 that saw its population jump threefold in the 1970s when nearby mines led an economic boom. Her father worked in one of the mines. Neither of her parents were college graduates, but they supported their two daughters' uh, college aspirations, especially when Trump decided she was going to become a doctor. She earned scholarships to Creighton University nearly 800 miles away in Omaha, Nebraska, but the financial challenges remained tangible. Though seemingly bound for medical school, she fell in love with Robert Browning's poetry. She would go on to earn her bachelor's degree in English, come home to Wyoming to complete a master's degree, and then study for her doctorate at the University of Florida. There, she wrote a dissertation on Victorian novels and the new laws being written then on domestic violence. Her revised dissertation became the first of several books and dozens of articles exploring gender, social justice, and cultural issues in the 19th century life and literature, a time close enough that contemporary society can understand the people who lived then and their motivations, but far away enough to have critical distance. As she noted in an interview that she gave during her time as president of the North American Victorian Studies Association, quote, if we can look critically at something that's happening in the 19th century, it may help us read our own cultural moment a bit better. And that, she said, is one very important reason to study history. Please welcome to the stage our president, Dr. Marlene Trump. Please, please take your seats. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Would you please join me in thanking the Boise State Trombone Choir and Sarah Paradis, Associate Professor of Trombone and Euphonium. I thought that was such an amazing opening. Uh, this year, they are raising money to travel to Osaka, Japan in July 2020 to perform at the International Trombone Festival. I think that was so extraordinary. I hope that you will support them. I want to begin today by recognizing people that you don't often get to see. I get to walk out here on this stage, but there are so many people who make an event like this possible. I wanna thank my team, especially Greg and Crystal for their help with this presentation, Heather and Paige and the staff here at the Morrison Center for their support on this event. Would you please recognize them? I owe so much to the extraordinary staff who was here when I arrived. Um, the staff in my office have been exceptional and, and amazing. I'm very grateful for them. I also want to take a moment before we begin to acknowledge you. If you are a member of the staff at Boise State University, will you please stand and receive our applause? Thank you for all you do. I also had some people call me out on Twitter this morning. So um, those of you in the Twitterverse who are here, will you please give me a quick wave? 
Hey, y'all, thank you. I am so excited to be here this morning. Um, I wanna welcome you back to this extraordinary campus. I wanna welcome you to this new academic year. And I wanna tell you why I am reading from Britain Remarks this morning. Those of you who have seen me speak in other venues know that what I prefer to do is hang onto the microphone and range around on the stage and just talk with people. I'm trying to be disciplined with my time because I know how hard it is to sit in a space like this for a long period of time. So I'm also gonna tell you that this talk has seven parts. I am in part one now. <laughs> that way you'll know how long you have to sit in these seats. And I invite you to be engaged with me here. I don't wanna have a, a quiet audience that's sitting on their hands. I wanna hear from you, so please, Feel free to respond back to me. I'm gonna begin this morning by talking about the moment that we live in. It is a politically volatile moment characterized by ideological divisiveness and polarization. It is a moment in which words can be weaponized by unfriendly or fearful audiences and even misunderstood by the friendliest ones. It is a moment in which it is a sign of bravery even to speak. We have seen such extraordinary bravery on the part of our faculty, students, community members, and people all over the state and region. I hope to honor their bravery by speaking to you from the heart today. This seems especially important to me because you and the State Board of Education gave me the honor of leading this path-breaking university, and I thank you for that. <laughs> Public universities have a special and vital mission to educate the people of the state. In the words of the Morrill Act signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln on July 2nd, 1862, they are meant to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the pursuits and professions in life. And here, liberal means a broad education grounded in the liberal arts. <laughs> A liberal and practical education that is meant to transform people's lives. Public higher education was built for the express purpose of transforming people's lives. This is an incredibly honorific mission. And our embrace of all people, especially in this vexing political moment, means that universities must remain spaces where complex discussions can take place, where difficult issues can be explored, where conflicting ideas and opinions can be heard, considered, and respected, where the smallest groups can be seen, and where underrepresented ideas can be spoken, where all people feel able to voice their truth, and where we respect those with, to, and about whom we are speaking. I believe that Boise State University can become a national leader in meaningful problem solving across political divides in this moment where it seems that we cannot talk to each other. I believe it is possible. This would be a profound service, not just to our university and to the city of Boise, but to the state of Idaho and to our region. We are aided by the fact that the people of this state, this city and this university are genuinely invested in openness, generosity and kindness. We care about what others think. We are willing to hear what they say. We aren't faultless. Sometimes our engagement with one another will cause harm. I've had a taste of this myself in the short time I've been here. <laughs> Perhaps you've noticed. 
but others in our community have faced so much more. That doesn't make me believe that discursive violence is inevitable or necessary. Even acknowledging this and recognizing our special place in the dialogue doesn't mean that such conversations will be easy or free from difficulty, but I believe in who we are. We have many responsibilities as a university to be sure, and we do them all so well. But if universities aren't meant to be bringers of light, then who is? Surely this is the very foundation of our mission. As a university, if we aren't engaging openly in and fostering important dialogue, striving for what is just and right and good, we may cause irreparable harm to the things that matter the most to us. We may render ourselves irrelevant to the most important questions of the day. And it is a tenuous time Universities are closing and failing across the country. Of the approximately 4,300 universities and colleges in the nations, 800 are at risk of closing, and 80 have faced consolidation with other institutions in just the last few years. And it's not just the privates. 50% of those that have been consolidated are in the publics. The world, my colleagues, is changing. We cannot remain outside the fray, nor can we be deaf to the issues, concerns, and fears that are brought to our doors. Part of the reason that BSU has been so effective and innovative is that it hasn't done that. We have done work that is pressing and relevant. We have engaged in complex conversations. The university has blazed new trails across academic fields and in pedagogy, in service to the world, in tackling complex problems. This is something of which you should be very proud in this moment. <laughs> Section two. <clears throat> Got some great pictures for you to look at. There we go. <clears throat> we can do this and much more. This campus is a place with a special capacity for innovation, creativity, and trailblazing. We have shown a special affinity for innovative thinking. <clears throat> Our academic deans are traversing disciplinary and college lines in ways that move us outside the silos that have defined higher education for so long and have sometimes even crippled it. Such interdisciplinary thinking we must do. To solve complex problems, we can't draw lines around ourselves and miss the chance to talk with one another or with those outside the university. Now, this doesn't mean we abandon basic research. I am a classically trained Victorianist. I un <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> People often say to me, what the heck is that? <clears throat> I understand the value of basic research in every field. In fact, in the last few years, I've been working on a book on unsolved murder cases from the 19th century. I got to tell you, it doesn't get more interesting than that. <laughs> I've written on freak shows, seances. People are like, what are you going to do that's more interesting than that? I was like, how about murder? <laughs> So I spent many years in the archive researching um, on this book. I saw some of the coolest archival things I've ever seen in my life. And then a few years ago, I team taught with a forensic scientist for a couple of years. We solved a 150 year old cold case. <laughs> but it also taught me so much. I got to learn things I would not have learned 
if I wasn't talking with that forensic scientist. Now, not everyone needs to be radically interdisciplinary. In fact, if we don't have people conducting and training others in that basic or foundational research in every field, we can't achieve great heights in interdisciplinarity. Both are necessary. However, this ability to speak across disciplinary lines is one of our greatest assets as we produce world-class research and engage our students in innovative pedagogy. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's allergy season. So I'm going to be doing that throat clearing every once in a while. <clears throat> Innovation, new thinking, will be vital in developing student and community-centered research enterprise that doesn't ossify into those rigid silos or inflexible thinking, things I've seen at many great universities. Those universities can't do what you can do. They can't do what we're poised to do in whole new ways, to create a new model of what universities can be that conduct leading edge research for students at every level, provide nimble responsiveness to the community and the region in a rapidly changing world, and offer innovative cross and interdisciplinary thinking. I want us to be bold about the ways we deliver curriculum so that it better meets the needs of our students. You know, new students now are different than we were as students. They have grown up with computers in their hands. I told my son about um, call-in radio contests the other day. <laughs> He's 17. <clears throat> He said, why wouldn't you just Google it? <laughs> I said, my child, there was no Google. There was no iPhone. Because they are different than we are. They are built differently than we are. Their brains are built differently than we are. We've got to think differently. If we don't do something different than what we were doing 30 years ago, we are underserving our students and underserving that grand and beautiful mission. But here, what's so exciting to me is that I know we can, because I've seen the evidence that you are willing to do this. Back to my script. <clears throat> If we can do this in a comprehensive and far-reaching way, we will provide national and international leadership. This is another area that the world needs the leadership of Boise State University. Section three. <laughs> Whew! In part because we haven't talked enough about the impact of our work in all areas, the faith of the mainstream of this country in higher education has diminished. Even though college going has increased since 2000, we have seen the numbers declining in almost every demographic for four year in graduate schooling since 2010. University enrollment was down by 2 million from the fall of 2010 to the fall of 2019. For the first time in our history, more middle-class white families are choosing not to send their students to college. Georgetown found that the gap in spending per student on instructional and academic support has widened in the past 10 years between very selective schools and high access public colleges like us. Those highly selective schools are spending three times as much per student. We understand the way resources can impact students' experience, but we also understand that we have this noble mission, and we all want to bridge that gap for the sake of our students and their futures, for the sake of the state in terms of what education can do, and in terms of honoring the investment that the people of the state make in us through our legislature. Sadly, 
57% of 18 to 24 year olds do not believe college is worth the cost, according to a 2018 Wall Street Journal NBC survey. In 2013, that number was 40%. 54% of white Americans consider going to college a risky gamble, according to a 2018 study. And those who identify as male have lower college going rates than females. Pew found in 2017 that 58% of conservative leaning voters believe higher education has a negative impact on the country. Two years earlier, that number was 37%. Civis Analytics and Echelon Insights have discovered meaningful, broad spread public doubts about college affordability and the value of a degree. Even while there is general agreement that some kind of post secondary education or training improves job prospects and that high school students should pursue it. There is also a shared belief that colleges don't provide students with useful skills. The two biggest reasons that people express concerns about four-year college is that they cost too much to attend and people fear it will push students to a particular political viewpoint. My friends, we have work to do. We can do far better at communicating what a degree can do to the public and employers there are so many kinds of degrees that people don't understand the value of right now. I can see I've got a big stadium slide and you guys are probably going, what the heck is that for? I'll go back to this one. <clears throat> it, used, it, it used to be that if you got a philosophy degree, for this was true for hundreds of years. If you got a philosophy degree, you went on to be the bank president or to run a business. That's what people expected you to do. That's what education in the liberal arts was because it taught you how to think. It taught you how to be a critical analyst. It taught you how to take volumes of information and make good critical analyses, to write well, to communicate well. Somehow, we've lost that knowledge that that's what the value of that degree is. We've got people thinking the only way now, even when I was in school, people used to say an English degree, what are you gonna do with that? Well, I don't know if you guys saw the recent news from Boise State University about our fighter pilot who has an undergraduate degree. Her degree, English. My degree was in English, so I think the answer to that question is, you can be a fighter pilot or a university president. <laughs> and so much more. But we haven't done a good enough job of helping people understand that. And I hear students say, as a professor, I hear students say all the time, yeah, I don't really like this major, but I've got to do something practical. Or my parents want me to do X. That's a communication problem. Because if we haven't helped people understand that they can study what they love and go on to do amazing things, if we haven't helped them see the ways in which those degrees from across the university will prepare them for life after university, professional life and personal life. And there are these extraordinary things about what a college degree does. Do you know that people with college degrees spend more time with their families and do more service work in their communities? It's not just professionally life-changing, it's personally life-changing. We have to work to communicate those things better. We can help parents and students understand that Boise State is a place where we respect the voices of our students and that we expect people to treat one another with respect in our community. This is a reflection of our shared value statement. I don't want a student to set foot on this campus and feel like they can't speak.
Now, students who come here will be challenged, of course. That's our job, to push them to think critically and carefully about everything. We have to do that to serve them. But we know the value of educating everyone. We want students to experience the benefit of higher education. We want them all to thrive. We can also do better at helping our students understand the power of their degree and the way in which it has prepared them for the world beyond college. We can continue to fight to drive down costs for our students and to be efficient in our operations so we can free up money to support them. We can advocate for resources to assist them so that they can do their best work. And I commit to you that I will. That's the right time for this slide. <laughs> we can work together to address these complex problems on all of these fronts and with regard to all of these issues I've just identified. I want to learn from you. You know this context, you know these people, and you have done so much already. You will be the source of our greatest innovation, our athletics team, they're known for their blue field thinking across our athletics programs. Our staff have been employing it to do amazing work on our limited budget. Our academic programs, faculty and students have advanced a national reputation for innovative work. It's important for me to learn from you about the amazing potential of this university and its future. And for that reason, I've asked each dean for listening sessions with each of the colleges. Those details will be forthcoming. Together, we will set a course for our exciting next steps, and your voices will be vital in that process. I am so excited and optimistic. Has that shown yet? <laughs> <laughs> I came here because I believe that Boise State was one of the few places in the nation that could do this critical path-breaking work where we could bridge the gaps, face those very real and pressing challenges and work to solve them. It's you that have made it so. And I am so happy and proud to be here to support that effort. I am certain of these outcomes because all of you have already done so much. Boise State, thanks to the hard work and vision of everyone in this room, has a unique trajectory in American public higher education. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to celebrating, celebrate Boise State's breathtaking ascension to an R2 university. This is Carnegie's designation for an institution with high research activity. This accomplishment was the product of university-wide effort that called upon every single faculty and staff member in this room. You have either personally toiled for this goal or built bridges over the challenges that stood in our path. For this, I thank you. I also want to say a word about why research is so important. Sometimes people think that what universities do is important is that they teach and that the research is this side project that faculty have and it's something about faculty vanity. <laughs> I admit I love spending time in the archive, but that is not why we do research. Research is world changing. The reason it is important and recognized is because the research enterprise doesn't just do things like get us closer to curing cancer, and it does. The research that we do across the university transforms fields of knowledge. And when you are a research university, it puts your students 
at the front and leading edge of that knowledge production. They get to be a part of what it means to solve the world's problems. They're not just reading it in a textbook. They're finding it in their labs and the archives and in the field. That is transformative for students. It changes their learning. It changes the world around us. It's very important for us to talk about that because sometimes people don't understand. So I charge you, not just to our faculty, but those of you who support that research enterprise, to help people outside of the university understand the transformative power of research. And our research enterprise continues to advance. Expenditures for research projects at Boise State University reached an all-time high of more than $41 million in the last fiscal year. That's an 18% increase. And you know what's really amazing? That is a 64% increase since 2014. Academically, Boise State's trajectory is nearly unrivaled. We have had 17 years of record numbers of baccalaureate degrees, three record first year classes in a time of national student decline. Indeed, our challenges are often about how we are gonna serve all these amazing students rather than trying to seek them out. We set a Boise State record this past year awarding 45 doctoral degrees and 19 educational specialist degrees. And what that means is the work that people are doing here at Boise State is spreading out in the world in terms of knowledge production. Those people are going on to produce that leading edge knowledge in other, in other places. We are literally changing people's lives so they can change the world. And the arts, too. Well, the arts are a part of our research enterprise. Thank you for calling out. <laughs> the creative work is integrally important to the research enterprise. And that brand new building that we've built, that's so exciting to me. That's going to really highlight our arts programs. Boise State University is the number one choice for Idaho high school graduates each year. One of every three students enrolled in Idaho's entire public higher education system, comprehensive universities, community colleges, and technical schools, one in three attends Boise State. And the nation sees you and your amazing work. Boise State was named one of the top 50 most innovative national universities by national higher ed leaders surveyed by US News and World Report this year. What an accomplishment. Our scholar athletes, which is often the first facet of Boise State that people encounter, have shown the same creativity, grit, and determination. For the second straight year, Boise State has the top ranked group of five athletics program in the Learfield IMG College Division I Directors Cup. It is a weighty, hefty name. This, this, thing, this, this program honors the institutions that have athletic success across many programs. You guys know who this is, don't you? <laughs> Allie Ostrander became three-time national champion in the steeplechase. That's the first time that's ever been done. And a setter side on the Olympics. And if you think it's amazing that she achieved those wins while jumping over obstacles in water, let's add to that the fact that she did it while she was an honor student and earning a 4.0. She
she is a model for what we want to achieve in our athletics programs. Nine teams in Bronco athletics have perfect academic progress rates. 14 Bronco gymnasts were named to the Mountain Rim Conference all academic team. Six Bronco teams were recently given NCAA public recognition awards, an honor bestowed on teams with academic progress rate in the top 10% of all squads in their respective sports. I'm gonna name them. This is women's beach volleyball, golf, tennis, gymnastics, and men's track and golf. Boise State is also celebrating 50 years of excellence in the honors program. It has grown now to more than 1,000 students. It has supported 13 students in winning Fulbright awards since 2013 and recently launched Boise State's third Rhodes Scholar. Finally, I want to celebrate that even in a year of presidential transition, you completed a campus-wide self-analysis and emerged from the accreditation process with glowing praise. <laughs> Accreditors saw your significant success in improving student retention rates and graduation rates, in expanding research and graduate programs, and enhancing engagement with both metropolitan and rural communities. They praised your initiatives around early academic success, and commended your focus in student affairs on recruiting, retention, and employability. They lauded your devotion to open educational resources and your efforts to help develop interdisciplinary graduate programs and infrastructures. I want to acknowledge the dedication, vision, and hard work of the whole team who advanced this important project. Will you please recognize them? And I also want to call out a particular individual, the driving force behind the successful accreditation process that has given me such a strong platform from which to begin as our own Jim Munger. <laughs> Jim, in fact, uh, played a role in persuading me to join Boise State University. Before I was offered the job, he reached out to me through the steering committee to send me a list of reasons that I should take the job. <laughs> Chief among them was that I understood that we are trailblazers, like those who have always lived on this land. He told me what a special place he thought it was, and Jim promised homegrown tomatoes. <laughs> if I would agree to come to Boise State. I was astonished when he left a box of homegrown produce for me at my office. It was the kind of generosity I've seen so much since I've been here in Boise. And this is a moment for me to thank you all for the extraordinary welcome you've given me since I've been here. Thank you. We're getting close. <laughs> I understand that even with all the incredible things you have already done, our next steps as a university will require real and significant effort. When you've gathered all the low hanging fruit, the work of advancing gets more challenging. We have limited resources and big demands. These facts have real consequences in our lives and in our work. Public universities have been scrambling to figure this out in the wake of our nation's general disinvestment in higher education. When states overall across this country have decreased their funding for higher ed by $9 billion in inflation adjusted dollars, but 61% of Americans believe that funding is flat or increasing for higher ed. We have work to do. Moreover, we are doing this work in a new landscape 
This is the place to which you brought us. Here in this R2 world, the horizons are higher, the mountains are steeper. What is also true here, however, is that each step we take has untold benefits for our students, our community, and our state. Remaining on this trajectory will make us national leaders. And I believe there are others who will support us in this remarkable mission in our work. We have not had a comprehensive campaign since the successful $150 million des destination distinction campaign that ended nearly a decade ago. That was a little like um, a tongue twister, wasn't it? As we approach our second century, Boise State will turn 100 in just 13 years. We have to keep our eyes on the next horizon, and we have incredible advantages to help us. We live and work in one of the fastest growing cities and states in the country. And in this rapidly changing world with new needs and new challenges, we have already deployed that nimble, creative, innovative thinking to meet those changing needs. We have already partnered with local organizations and businesses like Micron and Simplot to advance our state and in extend the impact of our research and creative work. We have created momentum to catapult ourselves forward. Philanthropists and foundations invest in the future and in big ideas that will serve us there, and that's where we live. I will work tirelessly to find the partners that will help us thrive and to help all of you do your good work. Our challenge then is to continue thinking about not only what we need tomorrow, but what our students, community, and the world will need in 20 years, in 50 years. We need to advance that blue turf thinking that has made an impact from athletics to academics, from staff and faculty to students, from programs to principals. Our more than $400 million effort to responsibly fund and expand the physical infrastructure of the university's growth in students and academic programs has received due praise, and we owe a great deal to Dr. Bob Custer for that work. Our extraordinary new facilities will give us a chance to adv advance the research and creative work that this university does, to teach our students in new ways, and to serve our community. Though we still have capital needs and shrinking space in a growing university, because as our capital projects have grown, the university has grown. We must be innovative and efficient with what we have and focus on other great needs as well. As we move into the future together, we must provide support for our faculty and our students. We need to support the innovative and devoted faculty who have built Boise State into the great university that it is today. And we need to attract new world-class faculty who are both top teachers and top researchers. Idaho deserves it and our students deserve it. We need to support students through scholarships that reward their hard work and encourage the transformational change that a college degree can deliver to an entire family, a city, and state. Fortunately, along with the incredible growth in our home community, we have built a growing base of support that will help us meet those changing demands. Nearly 25,000 individuals and organizations gave more than $25 million to Boise State last year alone. And I'm gonna really strive to raise resources for our faculty and our students. That is a, a very powerful commitment I have. The endowment grew by more than 4% to 117 million. We will hit 100,000 living alumni very soon, perhaps even this year. These are people who care about our critical mission, our innovative strategies, will support it through the future. You can help us all by reaching out even more alumni and supporters through Bronco Giving Day on September 12th. I encourage you to be truly engaged in this campus-wide effort.
Isn't our video team amazing? I believe we can inspire people to be a part of this exciting project that is Boise State University. <laughs> I want to take a moment to say a few things that are personal. I am so honored to be standing here before you today. The fact that I am here is quite a wonder to me. I had little thought of such a life growing up in a small town in Wyoming. All I knew is I wanted to make a difference. I am honored to be here to give my very best to you. I also had little thought of leaving my previous post. I have a 91-year-old mother with me and a 17-year-old son. I just moved them two years earlier. But you and this institution were so amazing, so beautiful in mission, so exceptional and open and innovative in culture, so rich in earnest, hardworking, optimistic, and creative people. I couldn't resist your magnetic pull. Jim Munger was right. So was Alicia Garza, who served on the search committee that brought me here. I thank them and many others for their advocacy. As your president, I'm ready to make sure that everyone in this nation knows about Boise State. I'm ready to do this work with you, to amplify our and channel our special magic so we can do greater and even more impactful work, so we can serve our community and lead our country. As I see it, that magic has been created with three key ingredients. We are trailblazers. We have been thought leaders in our academic, artistic, and professional fields. Our faculty, staff, and students have been inventive, energetic, and inspiring in opening up, opening up doors and windows that others didn't even recognize were there. We even cut some new ones in the walls. By casting off the trammels of well-worn and often outdated institutional tracks, we have seen new pathways and discovered paths as those in the West have always done. Boise State is focused on the issues, ideas, and challenges in our community. We have connected with industry partners. We have worked with our students. We have fostered bold, creative thinking for which you have been nationally recognized. It won't just be other metropolitan public universities who look to us for inspiration, but universities all over the world who seek vibrancy, relevance, and sustainability. We are committed to transformative teaching. We are engaging with and serving the community and indeed our state. I wanna take just a moment to talk about our rural students. I've already been talking with our deans and Provost Rourke. I think we have a special mission. Actually, all public universities have this mission. I think we have a special mission in the state of Idaho to strive to serve our rural students. Right now, many of them don't know why they should come to university, or if they do, they feel like they can't give up the chance to be where they are at home. Their parents aren't sure what they'll bring back or who will come back. We need to find ways to connect with those communities, to help them understand the benefit of a university education, and to serve them well. Because if we can do that, it is another place where we will provide national leadership. There are so many rural students that are being underserved by higher education in this country today. <laughs> Boise State has been a leader in shaping what an innovative metropolitan research university that is deeply engaged with the metro area, state, and region can and should become. 
We have shown how a public university can play a vital role in the city, state, and regional growth, as well as in the development of leaders, creators, and innovators in our communities. And we need to keep doing that important work. In this particular moment, with crises erupting nationally and even locally, our role as a public research university deeply embedded in place is critical. We need your creativity more than ever. You have so many new insights, so many important connections. You can see what must be addressed, but isn't yet being addressed in your fields, your industries, your communities. I'm counting on you to bring this to the fore. I wanna personally invite you to attend the inaugural celebration in the first week of October, because that is a moment about our future. My focus there will be to celebrate our university and to raise money for the true Blue Promise scholarships that make Boise State education accessible and affordable for all Idahoans. <laughs> On that day, we will also have a ribbon cutting at the truly striking Center for the Visual Arts. The work our arts community is doing is so important here in advancing the work of the university, and we will have an opportunity on that day to celebrate them and that new facility. It, will, it has transformed our state and the community and it's already vibrant outline. We will be launching into a new era together and to a Victorianist, that seems like an important time to remember our history and to don the academic regalia that is a symbol of that history that reminds us of the work we have been doing for centuries to transform the world. I am confident that we can meet our challenges together. I wanna to close with a, a quotation that our ASBSU Vice President, Michaela Melkert, recently shared with me from Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Wendy Wasserstein. It's something that I think you don't need to be told, but should be a landmark for this moment. Go out there and do something remarkable. Boise State University, this is our charge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now you may remember that I promised you food today. Please join me on the quad for lunch and music and the beginning of an exciting new era for us. Thank you.